Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes from Dan, VE7YRK. He says, hope you're staying well and safe. Can you show a time domain waveform of single sideband? I know what AM and FM look like, and I know the Fourier form or the frequency domain for single sideband, but I've yet to see what the modulated single sideband waveform looks like. For example, the AM and FM waveforms I'm thinking of are given at this uh, Wikipedia address. Thanks. Well, let's look at some charts and see what we can find, and then we'll talk about why you never see the amplitude form or the time domain form of a single sideband waveform. So let's go to the charts. All right, Dan's question here. Uh, he wants to see a time domain waveform of single sideband. Now, uh, in amateur radio, usually we show uh, how AM and FM work using time domain waveforms, and then we flip over to the frequency domain to look at uh, single sideband, uh, because it's a lot easier to do that. Now, he's referencing a uh, uh, link right here. This is what you find at the link. This shows the signal, the AM waveform, which the amplitude follows the signal here and then the FM waveform where the frequency follows the signal, where the frequency, where the signal is low, the frequency is low, where it's high, the frequency is high. This is what everybody shows. This is what is in all of the training literature for ham radio, and it's always done this way. AM is shown in the time domain, sometimes in the frequency domain. FM is shown in the time domain, and single sideband is always shown in the frequency domain. Now, the two are representations of the same thing, but one is plotted against time, the other is plotted against frequency. If we look at what's in the ARRL handbook, uh, and this is the latest 2021 edition, uh, the section on modulation, here we see um, a carrier wave, uh, the wave shape of the modulating signal and the resulting output, which is very nearly 100% modulated. Uh, and this is a single tone, okay? This is a single tone, so it gives you this. If you were to look at this in the frequency domain, where you have frequency across the bottom, say this is 10 uh, megahertz right here, uh, there's a carrier, this is AM again, a carrier, an upper sideband, a lower sideband. Now, the lower sideband is separated from the carrier by its frequency. So if you were to add another frequency in here that's twice that, you'd see another bump over here. And if you add a real speech waveform, you'll see stuff here that is repeated over here, except it's reversed. Well, in order to get a time domain um, single sideband signal, I need an oscilloscope, because there's no picture of it. You're not going to find a picture, and I'll show you why. But this is my scope. This is the Regal DS1054 Zulu, which I've had for a few years now. It was one of the very first things I purchased with channel funds. And I'm very grateful to all you fans out there for enabling to do that, because I've used this a fair amount. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we've got a, an antenna, a cantenna, which is a dummy load. And we're going to put the output of my uh, 7300 into this. And then we've got to introduce some sort of noise. Now, I'm just going to switch back over to the other camera so you can see the noise source. Here is the noise source. This is a little four states QRP kit and it's got a little arm on it right here. This is a code practice oscillator. You push on it, you get a tone. 
Now, it's not the world's best tone, but for a $15 uh, kit right here, minus the battery, which is kind of expensive, um, and 350 shipping, you can make this same kit too for studying the Morse code. It's even got the Morse code printed on the back of it. Now, this is what we use for the tone. So this tone right here, is a square wave and is a square wave that's full of lots of harmonics okay so that's what we're using is the modulating tone so it's the same across all all right so we're going to use a dummy load so we can do whatever we need we're going to use this little uh code practice oscillator it's from four states qrp uh it's from s dave 120 which is a long time ago uh, however, it is still for sale, and here is the URL for that. Uh, it's $15 plus 350 for shipping in the USA. It's a little more expensive if it goes somewhere else. Okay, it's just a simple little code practice oscill oscillator. You push down here, and you can hear it. All right, let's look at what we get off the scope. So this is the ICOM 7300 transmitting into um, a dummy load with a little uh, signal sampler taking some signal. This is one dit. Not the best form thing in the world, but it's one dit. And it would sound like a very nice dit with a nice rise time, nice fall time. Here is an AM broadcast. This again is the uh, the little code practice oscillator. Now the code practice oscillator has a complex waveform because it has so many harmonics in it. So you're seeing that right here. This is the waveform and you see the opposite of the waveform down here uh, being imposed on the carrier. The carrier would look more like this, just a steady thing, but this is being superimposed on it. Uh, this is 25 watts, by the way. Uh, 25 watts on AM is actually 100 watts PEP because the carrier is 25 watts and then you drop that to zero uh, when the waveform goes down and you uh, take it up to double the voltage uh, when uh, the waveform is peak. But double the voltage across the constant resistance means double the current. So you're going to go 25 watts with just carrier like this 25 watts and then it will actually go all the way to 100 watts and down to zero watts if this were fully modulated okay now i want to show you next are you ready is everybody ready this is really cool are you ready finally revealed for the first time in ham radio history the time domain waveform of the same signal the little Morse code practice oscillator in upper sideband. There. What's that? Well, it's a waveform that's pulsing in amplitude, but it doesn't look anything like the AM waveform, which varies quite a bit in amplitude. Things are kind of sort of constant amplitude here. Uh, what does this tell you? Well, the answer is it doesn't tell you much of anything because time domain waveforms, you can't look at the waveform and go, oh yeah, that's the signal. Whereas if you go up here to this over here, you can look at it in the frequency domain and see the signal, okay? You can see the signal Whereas down here in the time domain waveform, you can't see what's going on. Now, is there, that's because the, the difference between this and this is that in this, the carrier has been removed, no carrier, and no lower sideband. The lower sideband has been removed. Now, when you look at an AM waveform, you cannot look at it and say, 
oh, that's part of the upper sideband, that's part of the lower sideband. You can't tell from this. This is just amplitude that's in here. It's a representation of the signal, and here is the representation of the signal uh, with a minus sign in front of it. No, this is not the upper sideband. This is not the lower sideband. The sidebands do not appear in this waveform. Now, if uh, you were to stop transmitting, it would look like this, just steady carrier. Okay, but there's no carrier in single sideband. There's no lower sideband. Just a bunch of gushy looking stuff here that doesn't seem to mean anything. Now, if you are really intent on seeing a single sideband waveform in the time domain, you can do the simple math. This is from Wikipedia, the single sideband modulation that takes the math from the signal and creates the output signal. Let's see, we run into quadrature amplitude modulation, baseband, Hilbert transforms. We've got the radio character frequency in there. J represents the imaginary unit. Uh, and SA is the analytic representation, okay, with only positive frequency components. Yes, there is such a thing as negative frequency. And Euler's formula to expand E to the J2 pi F sub 0 times T. We get this equation here, and then it talks about coherent demodulation and lower sideband. Wouldn't it be easier just to think of it this way, like this? You drop the carrier, you drop the lower sideband, there's your upper sideband right there. And this is why in ham radio, we start like this, okay, the shape of the modulating signal, you get your amplitude modulated signal, which has a direct correlation to the modulating signal that you can see right there. This is called envelope modulation, okay? And in the frequency domain, it's easy to um, uh, think of because you got three spikes here. Now, in single sideband, we eliminate the carrier, we eliminate one of the sidebands, and it's just a single spike, spike there. And we see this in the carrier. We see this very nicely in the modulation of the AM, but we do not see it nicely in the time domain waveform. This is the time domain waveform for the same signal that's being broadcast, broadcast, created in AM uh, right here, okay? So if you're really, really into math and you've had basically graduate level calculus and stuff, sure, go ahead and dig into this. It's kind of fun, I guess. I've never actually done this. We skipped single sideband when I was in college because they said it was so out of date and yet it isn't it's used quite a bit in the telecommunications industry so there you go there you have it so there you have it uh, the, basically the reason you never see a time domain representation of a single sideband signal is that it's very difficult to look at that and make any sense out of it. Now, the radio itself cannot receive the single sideband signal without going to the trouble of recreating the carrier and inserting the carrier back into that signal at, uh, and then from there doing the detecting and getting out the equivalent of an AM signal. The difference, of course, is that in an AM signal, it contains its own synchronization reference, which is the carrier. Without the carrier, you do not have um, synchronization detail between the carrier and the uh, waveform that comes out. You're going to have phase distortion. There will be. There's no way around it because even though you put reinsert the carrier at exactly the right frequency, you don't know what the phase reference is. Now, some systems, not in ham radio, but some systems will transmit a small pilot carrier. 
that can be latched onto by a disciplined oscillator, that means it follows somebody else, uh, that oscillator will recreate the uh, tone to be inserted and it will be in phase and you will get somewhat of an improvement. Now, one of the key things to remember about the human hearing system is that it is much less sensitive to phase than it is to frequency. Now, trained ears, if you're a musician and you spend a lot of time with orchestras or an organ or a violin or whatever, you can hear what phase distortion does to the signal. But most people can't because their ears have never been trained to do it. Plus the way the human ear works in the cochlea are little hairs and the hairs vibrate at different frequencies. So basically what your ear does for your brain is give a sampling of the amplitudes of all the different frequencies. It does not give a sampling of the phase. It's not designed to hear phase. It does just because it's pretty good transducer, but it doesn't hear phase. So I hope that answers the question. It's kind of an interesting question. You know, one of those why 50 ohms questions, because um, why do we always show it in uh, time domain for amplitude and FM and in frequency domain for single sideband? That's because it's very simple to show in those two contexts. But if you try to put single sideband into the time domain context, it's just gibberish. It doesn't make any sense until you add a carrier back in. Well, don't add, mix. Mix a carrier back in, not analog mixing, but I mean RF uh, mixing. Multiply the waveform, the received waveform, by the carrier frequency. So there you go, there you have it. I hope you found that interesting. Um, if you have listened this far, I encourage you to go ahead and subscribe. This tells YouTube that this is a channel worth watching and that they ought to share that. And you can share it too directly with your friends. Um, if you want, you can actually embed the video in uh, your own website using the YouTube embed code. Not a direct copy, that's a copyright violation, but uh, using the embed code. And, and that's why that's there. And if you would like to support this financially, uh, you can certainly do so by going to uh, dcastler.com slash support and looking for a way that suits you. So until we next meet, 73.